In horror more than in other genres, there's usually one or two films that you really like that you never want to have to explain. We can't help what we like, but in fairness there are certain movies out there that just sound absolutely bonkers in concept. Sometimes the bonkers ones are the best ones though, so pick your poison. Just don't expect anyone to understand why you chose it. I'm Amy from What Culture, and here are 10 horror movie concepts that should never work, but do. 10. Swallow in Swallow, Hayley Bennett plays a bored and traumatised housewife who begins eating small, inedible objects. She suffers from a condition called pica, in which the patient develops a compulsive need to consume non-food items. Where the mind instantly goes when hearing this and linking it with horror tropes is perhaps that she eats gross things, like maybe she eats human teeth or babies or something, but trust me, it's not that kind of movie. In the whole of the film, the biggest and most upsetting thing that Hunter swallows is a small screwdriver, perhaps the length of a finger. Don't get me wrong, it's horrible to see someone choking on a screwdriver or puncturing their tongue on a thumbtack, but it's still fundamentally not that scary. What makes the film work is the atmosphere it builds. It's a constant air of repression. Hunter is stuck in her house like a prison and the world outside is hostile. You fear the blowback from her abusive husband and his family, the impact the world could have on Hunter being as fragile as she is, and the truth of her past that casts all of it in a miserable light. Sure, Woman Swallows Marbles isn't a great picture for a horror movie, but hear me out and give this one a go. 9. The Greasy Strangler The Greasy Strangler came out in 2016, which is utterly baffling because realistically, there's no place for a movie like this outside of a weird 80s fringe era. Do modern audiences really want to watch a movie about a greased up old man called Big Ronnie going around murdering and cannibalizing people? No, not really, you'd think. Well, apparently our assumptions were wrong, and an audience for this does still exist. Maybe it's something about the miserable nature of modern existence that draws us to the abstract, and this film is really f***ing abstract. It seems that its own insanity and the utter dedication to it is what makes this film work. In the words of one reviewer, it made me chuckle, made me wince a little, and it made me enjoy telling people about it and watching them squint dubiously as if they suspected me of making it all up. 8. Doctor Sleep Resurrecting a classic beloved IP is risky, especially when it's one of the most well-known and well-loved horrors of all time, in this case The Shining. It takes guts to try to riff on a film that people know so well and has so many intense, super hardcore fans. It's no wonder then that these super hardcore fans were upset when they heard the concept for Doctor Sleep a sequel to The Shining in which Danny Torrance pairs up with a young girl to defeat some shine-munching baddies and revisit the Overlook. In fairness, it does sound like it would most likely be cringe, fall flat, and essentially bastardise every good element of the original, but with an audience rating of 89% on Rotten Tomatoes, it's safe to say that this franchise instalment is certifiably fresh. One of the things that made it work was having horror genius Mike Flanagan at the helm. Best known for films like Oculus, Hush, and his stunning Netflix shows, Flanagan made sure to employ what he he knows about suspense, emotion, and climactic set pieces to bring the film to life. Remaining faithful to the book and the original film, Flanagan's thoughtful sequel captured audiences' hearts and reminded us that sometimes remakes, reboots, and revisits can actually be nice. 7. Spree Often movies like this have a certain air of snobbery from the older generations. These people are convinced that everyone under 30 is an idiot incapable of independent thought glued to their phone with one brain cell knocking about in their head. Hating technology is not a personality, and oh no, social media make me bad is not a plot. More often than not, concepts built around this idea like this fail miserably, not able to create a tone that's neither patronising nor ignorant. Luckily for Spree, though, they manage to skirt around the pitfalls and deliver a social media-centric film that doesn't make me cringe into the next century. With Joe Keery playing our unhinged main man, we're taken on a wild ride that sees him become a taxi driver serial killer. Jealous of other people's followings and wanting attention for himself, he constantly streams his activity to an audience of disbelieving fans. It has some good comedy beats, some funny performances, and some decent bloody kills. With someone less charismatic in the lead, maybe it wouldn't have worked so well, but Stranger Things' golden boy really came through on this. 6. Rubber it's a tricky line to toe, the line between goofy and stupid. Too often, horror comedies fall on the wrong side of that line, rendering films unenjoyable because instead of laughing with them, you're cringing at them. Somehow though, Rubber managed to fall the right side of this line despite literally everything going against that. The film follows a sentient tyre that comes to life randomly and decides to go on a killing spree. Oh, and the tyre's name is Robert. As well as being about a killer tyre, the film has an in-film audience watching a film about the tyre 
Fire. So we're sort of watching a film, but also sort of watching other people watching a film? Are we watching the same film? Is ours somehow separate? We don't know. It's completely unpredictable and ridiculous. And even from my fantastic description of it, it sounds like a terrible and incredibly hard to watch concept for a film. There's really very little nuance to bring to this one. Nothing I can point at and say, that's why it works. It simply exists because it can, and who am I to criticize that? Five, The Lighthouse. You stick Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson on an island together, entirely in black and white, with a weirdly humorous script and a mermaid that has a giant vulva on her tail, and you call that a movie? Good. Good for you. The Lighthouse is an entirely bizarre slow burner horror that pushes the limits of what we expect from cerebral psychological titles. There's barely any body horror to be found here, few jump scares or dramatic frenetic scores. Instead, what we have is an uncomfortable, claustrophobic experience anchored by stellar performances from our leading men. You'd think that nobody would want to watch two fishermen slowly descend into madness amongst a dizzying atmosphere of homoeroticism, self-hatred and alcoholism, especially if at random points throughout the atmosphere is broken with fart and poop jokes. And I know I couldn't wrap my head around how a concept like that could work until I gave the movie a chance. Somebody smarter than me will be able to spell out to you what exactly makes the mood, the script, and the performances tie together, but for me, it just works. Don't ask me how, but it does. 4. Slacks as is the case with most of these movies, I would really love to have seen how the pitch meeting for this film went. Did they go in with numbers and metrics proving why this was going to work? Did they reference other films that were somewhat similar in theme and did well before? Or did they just, you know, try their best with the vibe? Because surely you have to have done something special to get a movie commissioned on the premise of killer jeans. Slacks really is as simple as the jeans in an ethical clothing store becoming possessed and slaughtering employees all as one newbie tries to find out why. Hey, if you can find out why the genes are killing people, maybe you can stop the genes from killing people. It's logic applied to an illogical situation. It's a haywire concept with the potential to be an absolute flop but somehow they managed to pull it off. With a range of quirky characters and an authoritarian corporate environment, the addition of killer genes seems completely fair. It's a stupid idea for sure, but the film has its heart in the right place and makes sure to deliver lots of fun along the way. 3. Host Given that this film is now known for how well it pulled the gimmick off, you may initially be hesitant to accept that, on a base level, the concept of host sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Mixing the social media-focused social commentary subgenre with the supernatural one seems like the kind of endeavor where neither one gets fair representation. Essentially taking paranormal activity and having it play out live over a Zoom chat, host knew it was opening itself up to critique. Video calls are the ultimate symbol of lockdown life, and for the most part, we don't want to think about them any more than we have to. Making a whole film through the medium and having it be something that people enjoyed was no small feat then. The genre-bending, lockdown-phobic odds were against it, but clearly something about Host worked incredibly well. The film was praised for the chemistry between the actors, its writing, and its achievements in production giving the huge limitations it faced. In the end, that may be what made it work. They went back to basics with practical effects for some of the scares, they put huge care into their home lighting and stunts, and in the end, they reap the great product that they sowed. I still don't ever want to have another Zoom call, though. 2. T. The idea of your protagonist's main plight in life being her vicious vagina is funny. I mean, it's even funnier to think about her being in the middle of sex and her gnashes just making an appearance and munching the partner's pecker off. It's funny, come on. You'd think it would make a YouTube skit, maybe a short film at best, because after you've seen the gag a few times, it just kind of wears off, right? Well, that's what makes this film work. They took a concept that, on first contemplation, seems impossible to fashion into a movie because it's just comedic, and they built it up to be more than a cheap laugh. Whilst the concept itself is still funny on the surface, the wider context the film gives us roots the story in a societal problem that allows for deeper meanings to permeate. Yes, we get to laugh at a doctor getting his hand stuck inside her vagina mouth, but we also get the satisfaction of her learning to use a part of her body that she considers a weakness or her secret shame as a weapon of her own protection and agency, aka she chops her abusive stepbrother's penis off. For me, the film's a winner just for that scene. One. Tusk. 
You knew this would be here, didn't you? If you've seen any amount of what culture horror stuff before, then you know that Tusk lives in our minds rent free. However, if you've somehow evaded it thus far, then let me enlighten you. The film follows protagonist Wallace as he's kidnapped and transformed into a human walrus. We're not talking a tasteful crossover here, like maybe an amphibious man with big tusks and additional flippers. I mean, he's literally made into a big bloated walrus blob constructed of cadaver skin. The mastermind behind it, it seems, is trying to atone for his past offence against a friendly walrus, which as a motivation doesn't carry much weight. Thus, on a narrative level, the film has almost nothing going for it in terms of sellable concepts, and yet, here we are. It was first conceived of on director Kevin Smith's podcast, which many people would have just taken as a joke because obviously that could never work. Smith went on to prove us all wrong when he wrote and made the damn thing. So, never say never, I guess. And on that note, we've reached the end of this list of 10 horror movie concepts that should never work, but do. There will be plenty more of these films out there, so let me know what you would have included on this list in the comments down below. And remember to check out whatculture.com for more lists and articles like this every single day. As always, I've been Amy from What Culture, and I'll catch you next time.